This is News 12 Law Call. Hi there, and welcome to News 12 Law Call Zoom Edition. I'm Neil Gordon, pleased to welcome back into the program a pair of members of the Hawk Law Group, uh, Chase Hawk, as well as Reed Sanders. Hello, gentlemen. How are both of you? Doing well. How are you? Fantastic. Uh, Doing well, enjoying, yeah. enjoying the crisp weather of late <laughs> and uh, looking forward to things as we, uh, we move along through the pandemic. Things to, seem to be getting better. Um, our topic tonight is uh, all about injuries, and we have several email questions, and um, we want to begin with you, uh, Reed, if we can. This one comes from uh, Kim, who said that personally she got into a real bad wreck, a wreck the other day. Her husband was in the vehicle, still in the hospital, but the insurance people have been calling already. What should Kim do? She's pretty upset, and she's kind of concerned about saying the wrong thing. Well, the first thing that she should do is not talk to the insurance company. I know that sounds uh, counterproductive, but she's not, she doesn't know the full extent of the damages. Um, and, and when she says she doesn't want to say the wrong thing, she is going to say the wrong thing because even honest answers can be misinterpreted. And so you can say, you know, well, I, I, I have uh, my neck hurts or, or we've had cases where somebody said my shoulder hurts. And later down the road, maybe a couple of months, they find that shoulder pain is actually stemming from your neck. Well, then the insurance company says, well, you didn't even mention your neck. How can your neck be injured? You've been for three months talking about your shoulder. So it's better to say nothing at all, uh, especially in an extreme injury. Get an attorney. you got to find out what the limits are, find out if you can get the bills reduced, all that stuff. So the first thing she needs to do is have no contact with the insurance company and talk to a good trial attorney, attorney as soon as possible. When in doubt, do nothing. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Chase, pretty much the same, whether it be Georgia or South Carolina, that's just a good rule of thumb. Yeah, under those circumstances, it's always good to talk to an attorney. In most cases, it's free uh, to when you have a personal injury claim, and uh, they're going to give you at least some good advice. Uh, most people in these situations are kind of lost in the woods, and the attorney can kind of point you in the right direction for whether or not you end up using them or not. Uh, yeah. uh, they can point you in, a, in the right direction, especially before you talk to an insurance company, because they only have one thing uh, on their mind, and that's saving themselves money. And I know, Chase, me and you talk to people all the time that come in and might ha have a case that um, that we don't take, but we can certainly give them advice on how to handle it. You know, if the, if the, if the bills are very low, if the, if the injuries are very minor, we can advise you on how to go and do it yourself. Um, and then if we see something in there that, that needs some kind of expertise we can jump in and help you yeah that's that's one of our policies is that if we don't make if we don't make a difference we don't make a dime so uh if we can't make a difference in what you'd ultimately recover in the case then we advise you not to you know use an attorney especially if you're you know willing and able to handle something like that yourself and gentlemen that would what reed was speaking of would that be magistrates court where there's a certain limit is that where you would sort of uh defend yourself well, did you ask Reed there? I'm sorry, Neil. Go ahead, Chase. I, Go I, ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, th there's a claim process prior to where you can actually negotiate with the insurance company, but under no circumstances do we advise you talking to them. Usually, if if we advise a client to um, handle it themselves, we explain to them the basics of you have to have your medical records, you have to have your medical bills, and you have to submit them along with a letter to the insurance company demanding what is fair in the case. And uh, we advise our, the uh, clients that, that, they, that if they're going to do that, that everything should be done in writing. Um, it's, it's a little more clear when you put things in writing and uh, things can't necessarily be interpreted or changed about what was said and, and at what time. So uh, if it goes beyond that, then yes, you can go to magistrate court and, and a local magistrate will help you resolve that claim. Hey, sometimes uh, injuries are more life-threatening, and uh, Paul had a question. Uh, can you please explain wrongful death claims and who is able to bring one on behalf of a deceased relative? Yeah, that that is a, a difficult thing that we deal with quite a bit, unfortunately. Um, but in, both in Georgia and South Carolina, there's some statutory rules about who gets to bring these claims and what types of claims. And it starts out with uh, if the person that has died, it's known as the decedent, 
has a spouse, that spouse has the right to bring the wrongful death claim. Uh, there are separate claims in Georgia uh, that the estate would actually have to bring. And the probate court usually will appoint an administrator or if there's a will uh, that uh, appoints a personal representative, then that personal representative would be responsible for actually bringing a claim for the medical bills associated with the person's treatment from the time that they were injured to the time that they died. Um, and also bring a claim for, for what's, what's called a survival action for the pain and suffering that occurred from the time the injury occurred to the time the person ultimately uh, passed. And sometimes that can be you know, a negligible claim when the person died a couple of seconds after the injury. And sometimes it can, it can be very significant when a person you know, lingered for a number of days or weeks. Uh, but usually it's passed through the statutory probate process and, you, and it goes to the spouse um, then the children, uh, unless the children are not of age, and and if the children are not of age, it would pass to the decedent's parents. Um, they would be the next people in line to uh, bring the claim, and then from there, brothers and sisters. Chase, just to kind of just to hit on that, how I always remember it is that it's kind of a mathematical formula to me. It's and it, and sometimes workers' comp is different, but a regular personal injury and and a wrongful death is is equal, then down, then up then sideways. So equal, spouse, down, children, up, parents, sideways, your brothers and sisters. That's right. And that's the order that it goes in. And call the Hawk Law Group for a chart. It will back <laughs> that up for sure, right? Um, Reed, before we scoot to the break, we'll try to squeeze one more in from Kevin. Bad accident, hit by a car, torn meniscus in his uh, knee, neck injury, uh, the ambulance bill around 5,000, x-rays at the ER near 4,000. He's been seeing a chiropractor, uh, surgery is going to run about 70 grand. He's in a poor financial position. He thinks he'll be evicted from his apartment at the end of next month. He really feels like he has to settle for financial reasons. Uh, boy, what can he do? Well, that's a tough question. And the reason it is, is because we don't know the limits of the case. So if he has a $70,000, and I don't know if he's got health insurance. So if you have a $70,000 surgery, and there's only $25,000 in your on the policy that hits you, the limits, that's the max you can get. Well, then you're going to get that 25 tendered, meaning you're going to get that check very, very quickly because your damages well exceed the limits of the case. So if that happens and you have health insurance, then you want to get the limits prior to the surgery because then your health insurance will pay for the surgery. Now, if the limits of the case are a million dollars, then you don't want to settle that claim prior to the surgery because you don't know if you're going to have future treatment, uh, physical therapy, that kind of thing. So if you have large limits, no liability questions, and you have big time problems financially, then you can look at pre-settlement funding. I don't love pre-settlement funding because of the rates that they charge, and it makes it harder for the case to get resolved at the end. But in this situation, if you have the limits and it's clear liability, that's what I would recommend. If not, the limits are low, you get them tendered quickly, get the bills reduced as fast as you can, and then have the surgery if you have health insurance later down the road. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, well, uh, we're just gonna take our first commercial break and the other side of the break, we'll explore a pair of slip and falls at a store and at the beach. Stick around, you're watching News 12 Law Call. Welcome back to News 12 Law Call with award-winning broadcaster Neil Gordon. And from the Hawk Law Group, attorney Vic Hawk, with more than 30 years experience and millions of dollars awarded to his clients, attorney Reed Sanders, born and raised in Thompson and known for his strong courtroom skills. With criminal law, former police officer, now lawyer, Sean Merzlach, and with South Carolina injury law, trial attorney Chase Hawk. Plus, guest attorneys from across the CSRA. Your rights, your calls, live. News 12 Law Call. Welcome back to News 12 Law Call Zoom edition. We're not able to take any calls right now, but we are sharing some email questions from across the region. We welcome back into the show both attorneys Reed Sanders and Chase Hawk from the Hawk Law Group. 
before the break, we started to talk a little bit about slip and falls. And um, we're going to start with one at a store. And this comes from Carletta. And she slipped and fell in a store, went to the doctor, aggravated a disc in her back. She's not been able to work, been going to some physical therapy. Uh, the store's insurance person contacted her and told her they're not going to be liable. So she's kind of holding the bag, a bunch of hospital bills and doctor bills and needs some sage advice. Well, Carletta, this is a time where uh, most people will need an attorney um, right away. Anytime there's a slip and fall, you are kind of uh, in a hard place as the victim in this case. You have to prove in order to hold them responsible that the that they knew about the, the spill or whatever hazard it was uh, on the floor prior to you falling in it or slipping on it, or you have to be able to prove that they should have known about it. And the way you prove that is if there are, uh, you can prove that there were employees that were in the, the area, if the store's policies were unreasonable or they didn't have any policy about inspecting the floors to try and uh, make sure that there were no spills or slips and falls. And in order to do that, you have to request that this store maintains any sort of evidence that they have. The logs about the, the number of employees that were there that day, um, the logs or the policies and procedures that were in place at the time that you fell, any sort of video that might be out there. And the way you do that is with a spoliation letter. And this is something that an attorney knows um, as a matter of course, to do as soon as the client comes in with this type of injury and this type of issue is to send a letter telling them to save all of this important evidence that you may need um, at a later time. Uh, aside from uh, having an attorney help you with this, if they've already denied your claim, you're, you're going to be hard pressed to be able to hold them responsible um, at the end of the day for, for not maintaining those floors uh, properly. So go see an attorney and they will be able to help you with this issue. And then the second part of that chase too, is you got causation issues. And what, what I mean by that is um, she was say, she said that she had a pre-existing disc in injury that was re-injured or made worse. So that's where you have to show, you know, this caused this to be different. And so you really, it, it, that's a tough case and you're, you're gonna have to have a, a good trial attorney help you with that one. Right. Well, well, gentlemen, a lot of folks from Georgia, South Carolina head to Florida for the beach, you know, summer and fall time. And uh, Michael did the same. Uh, the whole family uh, went to the beach last month and he uh, uh, he fell on a loose step at their hotel. He broke his collarbone and the hotel is saying it is not their fault. What do I do now? Now, should Michael contact somebody in the CSRA to deal with it, or would it be out in Florida since this occurred on the sandy beaches of uh, Florida, the Sunshine well, State? Let's, yeah, that's right. Um, well, you can you can do either. Uh, so, local council is is I mean, well. If you're you know from here, I would recommend getting an attorney that lives here. And then the attorney from here can have local counsel there in Florida. And the reason I say this, because it's much easier to communicate in your own state, your own county, your own district or whatever. Um, so and this goes back to the same thing Chase just answered before. You know, we got to show or, or whoever's got to show that the, the company or the hotel knew or should have known that there was a hazard there. Um, so this is probably most slip and falls and, and trips and falls and premise liability goes into litigation, meaning that you have to file a lawsuit. So a Florida attorney or somebody that is licensed in Florida is going to have to file that case. But a local where you live attorney hiring someone there to and then associating somebody in Florida is always a good way to go. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chase. Kim was in a wreck back in April, and at the time, her back was a little sore. She just expected things would uh, proceed and get better. It's actually gotten worse. She's been to the doctor many times. Um, she did not file a medical claim at the time. Is there any kind of statute of limitations? Uh, yes, for Kim, that, there is a statute of limitations, both in Georgia and South Carolina. And Georgia is going to be two years, and South Carolina is going to be three years from the date of the 
actual injury. And so you do need to uh, actually file that claim in court uh, within those two years in Georgia or within those three years in, in South Carolina, or your claim was, is going to be gone forever. Uh, you can try and negotiate with the insurance company prior to actually filing the lawsuit, but it has to be done within those time limits. And if you don't file your claim, it's, it's going to be gone. So if it was just this last April, you're in good shape. I would advise you to go talk to an attorney um, and, and get some advice about how, how best to, to proceed. And, and one thing, uh, Neil, a lot of people get confused on the statute issue. The case, that means the case has to be filed before two years or three years, like Chase was talking about. That doesn't mean the case is resolved in that amount of time. So people get real worried about it. But if the case is filed, then you're safe. And there's one other thing I, I wanted to mention on the previous question, if I could. Uh, the, the general public thinks if, if, if you have multiple attorneys, you have to pay more money or, or the, the percentage goes up. Well, if you have a attorney where you live and, the, and that attorney associates another attorney, the price to the, to the client is exactly the same. The attorneys would split the fee, but it would not come out of your pocket. So that's why I would say it's always better to have a local one and then a person that actually is at the place um, where the accident or trip in, involved uh, happened. Two legal bites of the apple, if you will. If there you, you go. Will. All right. Very good. Hey, we're going to take a break. And uh, for those of you doing some repairs on your homes and uh, bringing in contractors or some things you need to know about liability, we'll explore that after we pay the bills. You're watching News 12 Law Call. Well, thanks so much to the Hawk Law Group and their attorneys, uh, Reed Sanders and Chase Hawk, for providing such a great service. So we wanted to give you the telephone numbers uh, to get in touch with them. Uh, you can simply remember it by dialing all fours with a 706 area code. You can also go to hawklawgroup.com, uh, get involved in a live chat and learn lots of good legal resources as well. And their, uh, their main office is on Telfair Street, but there's three other satellite offices in the CSRA. Okay, gentlemen, we are uh, back to the email questions. And um, Chase, we wanted to open up with one that uh, involves a pretty serious uh, medical condition um, that ended in death. It comes from AC and AC's mom was a sickle cell patient she passed away because um, it's claimed that they gave her anesthesia and she was allergic to it. This happened almost a year ago. Does AC still have a right to make a claim? AC, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, this is wrongful death claims are always very difficult to deal with. And when you stack medical malpractice on top of it, it becomes a little bit more problematic. Uh, your question is directed sort of towards the time limit. Um, and in most cases, you're still going to be within the time limit in this situation. In Georgia, it's two years. South Carolina, it is three. There can be some situations in which if the hospital is an actual state hospital or there's a state actor involved, um, it can limit the, the time limit. But in most cases, you're still going to be okay in just a year. And your case in the fact scenario you gave me is extremely complex and there's a lot of things that have to actually be determined uh, prior to me telling you, do you have a claim? Um, in any medical malpractice claim, you have to have an expert uh, come in and look at, see what was done by the doctors that treated your mother and determine as to whether or not they made a mistake. They deviated from the standard of care or the course that they're supposed to take um, when they're treating someone with your mother's conditions. Uh, you would have to determine whether or not, you know, there might be a situation where sick, anybody with sickle cell cannot receive anesthesia. I don't know that. An expert would, and they would have to opine or give an opinion that, that this um, condition was treated uh, incorrectly and because of the way your mother was given the um, anesthesia, uh, uh, it caused her death. Now, 
also we have to find out whether or not your mother told them that she was allergic to this particular type of anesthesia because the doctors could have done exactly what they're supposed to okay but they failed to take note of the fact that the, your mother had explained to them that that she was allergic to this anesthesia in that circumstance we would be able to hold um, these people responsible for the medical malpractice and so this is a very complex situation i'd advise you to go talk to an attorney very very soon because these things take a lot of time to develop correctly all right and uh, read one more uh, question this from garrett who inherited a very rickety old home with lots of hazards he has some repair folks coming next week to rewire it put on a new roof as well if one of them gets injured can garrett be liable or is he covered by his homeowner's policy that's, a, that's an odd question because um, your homeowner's policy would come into play if you are liable. So if you're liable, then you're, then, so that he's asking that it's like it's separate, but no, if he is liable, then the homeowner's insurance would cover him. Uh, to avoid liability, you would tell the, the workers or, or the foreman and explain to them everything that you know that is wrong with the home. Um, they are coming to do work, so they are coming to benefit themselves, so they have a higher standard of care that they have to, to, to use. Um, but if you warn them of any known hazards, then it, th their assumption of the risk they're taking, so you wouldn't be liable. But even if you are, your homeowner's insurance is covering you for your liability, so you would be safe either way. And right. less than 30 seconds, so if they have something like workers' compensation, that would be helpful as well. The, the, the contractor should have work or uh, workers compensation. That would be the first, um, you know, recovery. The second recovery would be against the person who was liable for it, which would be the homeowner. Okay, wonderful. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, the bright minds, the best <laughs> and brightest of the That's Hawk right. Long Group. Reed Sanders and Chase the A team Hawk. is what they call me and Chase, you know. Well, I understand just... that. I understand that. And, uh, we appreciate your insight, both of you. It's great to see you all again, and uh, we'll be back again next Sunday with another edition of News 12 Law Call. Take care, everyone. Take care.